Hello friends and comrades, Mike here. Today we're going to be looking at an extraordinarily influential article by Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa called Undoing Appropriateness, Racial Linguistic Ideologies, and Language Diversity in Education. So on a real quick note, Rosa just published the book. It's called, and it's all about this uh, racial linguistic perspective, so check that out. Um, in fact, I just finished up his book, so then I thought, well, shit, let me do that article they have, because um, I remember reading it in a lot of classes, three classes, actually, and for some reason, in each one, uh, there was some pushback from a white identifying student, because for whatever reason, they felt uh, personally attacked uh, for some reason. Um, and then another common question was, do you have to be white to play the role of the white listening subject. So we're gonna address all that stuff. Um, so first, uh, we gotta look at the words in the title, especially racial linguistic ideology. So let's pull them apart, language, then race, and then we're gonna put them, put them back together because part of this project is exactly looking at how language and race are not discrete autonomous entities. Uh, in other words, how we are looking, um, in other words, we're looking at how language shapes our perception of race and how race shapes our perception of language. So uh, let's look at linguistic ideology first. So racial linguistic ide ideology, linguistic ideology, that section. So there's a whole set of literature on this stuff. For now, let's think of linguistic ideologies as ideas and representations of language about, so these are ideas about what language does and what it's best used for. So in other words, these are ideas about the nature of language. Um, these representations will, at some point in history, on some societal scale, serve and protect the interest and hierarchical standing of a specific group. And each one of these language ideologies, each one of these linguistic ideologies emerges from history. So now adding the ratio or ratio to language ideologies. So ratio linguistic ideologies. So this signals that we're talking about processes of racialization. Now that word has a million definitions, but for now let's highlight um, the overlap between our really quick definition of language ideologies and the word racialization. So these are, again, ideas and representations about groups of people um, or ideas about the nature of race. For example, superior, inferior races are said to exist. Although today we tend to say superior, inferior cultures exist. Um, so ideas and representations that will serve to protect the interest and hierarchical standing of a specific group. So each of these ideas and representations also emerge from history. So we are now ready to talk about the relation of ideologies of race and ideologies of language and how they support one another or how they co-constitute one another. That's important here, co-constitution, because it means that these are not discrete entities, but emerge from one another, meaning they rely on each other somewhat to exist. So we're used to thinking about language and race separately in education. Um, so this assertion alone is kind of... Now, Flores and Rosas are saying that appropriateness um, is a language ideology through which appropriate speakers emerge. So remember, um, language ideologies, ideas about what constitutes appropriate language at appropriate times. That over time, through history, is taken as a transparent objective fact about the nature of language. However, language has speakers. 
language does not exist solely in some abstract realm. So if we remember that race and language are co-constituting processes, then we got to ask, um, is there a racializing aspect within the idea of appropriateness? Um, is appropriateness a racial-linguistic ideology? So we got to look at also the history of appropriateness. Who has the power to define appropriateness? Whose interests are served and protected by the idea of appropriateness? All of a sudden, this thing we call appropriateness is not a fact of language, but an ideological construction that we need to break down. If appropriateness is a construction, then that means language and linguistic forms that are prescribed objectively within the appropriateness model uh, must also be called into question. Uh, so what are the assumptions held within that we no longer see because appropriateness is perceived as this objective fact of language, a fact of nature? Appropriateness is what we think of as normative. And as we have seen through history, normative, the idea of normative, is closely linked to this thing we call whiteness. So this is where the idea of the white gaze comes in for the theory. Um, the white gaze privileges dominant white perspectives as normative. Now, if it's normative, it also has the power to define deviancy. Uh, the white gaze, uh, with the word gaze, um, seems to be talking mainly about vision, right? Um, but Flores and Rosa say that the part of the perception of the white gaze is also the ability to hear and to listen. Um, hence their term, white listening subject, who also has the power to establish norms of language practice. So they say, and this is on page 151, the white listening subject should be understood not as a biographical individual, but as an ideological uh, position and mode of perception that shapes our racialized society. So a mode of perception with the power and legitimacy to guide our perception of language and race. Um, indeed, it guides our perception to see language and race as separate entities. Additionally, Flores and Rosa say the definition of appropriateness is based on an idealized white speaking subject that speaks a perfect standard language. That standard is the norm by which deviance is measured. So this perfect speaker is also believed to be monolingual. And in an interesting twist, we start assuming that part of the reason that the perfect speaker is so perfect is exactly because they are monolingual. So keep in mind, this norm is based on a standard or academic language that is not actually spoken by anyone, but we treat it as simply existing because it continues to be legitimized by various institutions in society. One of those institutions being education. So when we perceive inappropriate speech, we are perceiving a deviation from a norm that is not linguistic alone. It's not purely linguistic, but it's a deviation from a norm based on racialized perceptions of language, based on the perception of a white listening subject, and in relation to an idealized white speaking subject. And finally, the last crucial aspect, or another crucial aspect, because there's a lot of crucial aspects in this article, um, but we got to think about the body of 
students subjected to the white listening subject, the body, actual body. Um, the body itself, obviously, is part of race. Um, seems like a, you know, duh observation, but perhaps you hadn't even thought about the body until just now. Um, because we're talking at this very spacey, abstract level, right? Um, a major tenet in education philosophy is that success is based on merit, um, on, the, on the hard worker. Uh, that is the ideological box that we're working in. So if the racialized student were to just gain this academic standard, um, the standard language as a resource, then it's thought that they will have a fair and equal shot in American society. But as vast amounts of literature shows, racialized bodies never quite get there. Um, very simply, that box that we're working in emerges from the perception of the white listening subject. So in that case, yes, anyone can perceive language practice from the position of the white listening subject. And as they make clear in other places, other articles, institutions can be white listening subjects. Uh, for example, institutions that categorize uh, students as ELL or heritage language learners or all those other categories, right? These are, these are institutional categories. Um, so a racial linguistic perspective encourages us to stare straight back at the white gaze. If we know it's there, listening, we can better respond to it. Um, so instead of working within this box and expecting to see all these magical results, we start to question the box itself. Um, it's a box that doesn't just objectively exist. It's a box that protects and preserves interests of specific groups. It reproduces hierarchies. It's a box with a very long and violent history. Um, this is where you got to look at uh, the next article uh, Rosa and Flores wrote together, which to me really clarified questions as to who and when and where the white listening subject emerges. Okay, so I hope I gave some of you all a running start into this article. It's pretty damn complex. Um, I hope I translated some of these big ass words for you. Uh, if you read it, and you know, had feelings but didn't quite understand it, then um, read that next article I told you about. Um, again, these aren't easy reads, but uh, just read them slowly, have some patience. Hopefully this video helped you out. Um, so that's it for now. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook and uh, academia.edu and all that shit. I will see you soon for your next lecture.